Today, we'll be talking about use cases, specifically the payments use case. In this video, I'll show you how to do it in CockroachDB, any considerations you need to make with regards to scaling, resilience, consistency, security, and regulatory compliance, and why CockroachDB shines for this use case. In any system that takes payments, you'll be interacting with this use case. These systems might be payment gateways, the systems that create an interface between a merchant, i.e. the retailer that you're interacting with, and a payment processor. They might be the payment processor themselves, the interface between the payment gateway and the credit card providers or the banks. Or they might just be any merchant system that stores your payment information. Given the sensitive nature of data being handled, this use case comes with some of the most stringent requirements of any of the use cases. Before we get going, it's worth noting that some of the world's largest payment gateways, payment processors, and banks run on CockroachDB. Chances are you've made an in-store or online payment for products. Those payments would have been forwarded by the store or merchant where you bought those products to a payment gateway. This payment gateway is the interface between the merchant you interacted with and the banks. At every step of the process, your sensitive payment information is being processed and or stored allowing your transaction to be captured, any required fraud detection to be performed, and ultimately, money to be debited from your account and credited to the merchant's account. Payment data is some of the most sensitive data a system is ever likely to process, and it rightly comes with some of the strictest regulations. CockroachDB can help you achieve the PCI DDS compliance you might need depending on where you operate within the payments use case. It provides security features such as strong cryptography, which includes encryption in transit, encryption at rest, strong column level encryption, and hash algorithms for additional protection of data at rest, CMEX, customer managed encryption keys, to give you control over the encryption of your data at rest, RBAC, role-based access control, to support the principle of least privilege, egress perimeter controls, to prevent unauthorized data exfiltration, and audit logging, so all users of the system are accountable for their actions. CockroachDB was built to scale and so reduces the operational complexity inherent in scaling and as a direct result any associated risks on customers. When you scale a CockroachDB cluster you're not just scaling for reads but also for writes meaning you can scale for not only read heavy workloads but also write heavy workloads. New users and markets can be reached as your application and user base grow. Scaling a CockroachDB cluster doesn't require downtime and data can be pinned to geographic regions, helping you achieve regulatory compliance as you scale. In a transactional database, data must be 100% correct 100% of the time. If it's not, money might go missing, patient medical records might be lost or be incorrect, a supply chain might suffer disruptions, or you could lose customer trust. Eventual consistency doesn't cut it when it comes to critical infrastructure. Historically, you've had to make a choice between scale via NoSQL databases or consistency via relational databases. CockroachDB offers both scale and consistency. If you're unable to prove that data is being consistently stored and processed, this could mean a failed audit. Data doesn't usually exist in a vacuum. It's usually part of an ecosystem of tools and system integrations, including, in the case of finance, fraud detection, authorization, and clearing. CockroachDB's transactionally consistent change data capture allows you to build these integrations with confidence. Without these events, the responsibility for ensuring consistent transmission of data to multiple systems is yours. In today's demo, we'll be simulating a card present transaction flow. In this scenario, the customer taps their card onto a POS or point of sale system or EPOS, electronic point of sale. This is done by way of form on the merchant's website. That information is sent to the acquirer the merchant's bank via their payment gateway. The acquirer contacts the card company, which forwards the request to the issuer, the customer's bank. The issuer validates the transaction to ensure that, for example, the customer is allowed to make the transaction and also that they have sufficient funds to make the transaction. The request returns via each of the processing parties and back to the merchant who either confirms the payment, issues a challenge to the customer or rejects the payment. I'll be simulating four things today, a customer, a payment gateway, a payments processor, and a fraud detection application, which will receive by way of CDC a stream of transactionally consistent events from CockroachDB, allowing it to flag up transactions which might be fraudulent, all of which are simulated, but should give you a better understanding of this use case. For the local part of the demo, I'll spin up a CockroachDB cluster simulating regions US East 1, EU Central 1, and AP Southeast 1. 
I'll spin up a local Kafka node that will be used in this example for fraud detection and we'll listen to CDC messages from CockroachDB. I'll create a fraud check channel. That's where my fraud check messages will be published. I'll create a payment database. I'll enable super regions and then I'll create my super regions. This isn't strictly necessary for this local example, but it's good practice if you're working in a payments use case across multiple regions and need to pin data geographically to those regions. I'll use that database and then I'll create some tables. First, I'll create a users table that will store their ID and their email address. Note that it's regional by row, so we'll pin user data to their nearest region. Then I'll create a card table that will store the user's card information and it too will be pinned to their closest region. Next, I'll create an enum to represent the various statuses an order can be in and a composite type for the amount column. This will store the value as an integer and the currency as a string. The last table I'll create is the orders table itself. This will have a payment reference, which will come back from the payment gateway once a payment has been successful. It too will be pinned to the user's closest region. Next, I'll wrap the logic to decrypt card information into a function. This will take an order ID and an encryption key, which is only known to the database and the service. And finally, I'll create a change feed that will publish into our local Kafka node any changes that are made to the orders table where a payment has been successful, essentially completed orders. Next, I'll run the payment processor service. It's just a stateless service that either simulates a successful payment, a decline payment or a fail payment. 70% of the time it will come back as accepted, 20% of the time it will come back as declined, and 10% of the time it will come back as failed. Next, I'll start the payment gateway. This is a stateful service that takes a database URL, an encryption key that will be used to encrypt and decrypt card information. It will communicate with the payment processor and it exposes two endpoints, one that allows a customer to add a card and another that allows a customer to check out their order. And finally, I'll start the fraud service. This connects to Kafka and performs a very contrived fraud check. In this example, anything below 10,000 is accepted as non-fraudulent, but if it's greater than or equal to 10,000 and is any one of these currencies, the contrived algorithm flags it up as potentially fraudulent. Let's insert some data to start the simulation. I'll create a user. I'll create a USD order of less than 10,000, a USD order of greater than 10,000, a Transnistrian ruble transaction of less than 10,000. Transnistrian rubles is one of the currencies that I've added to the algorithm of the fraud checker. And finally, a Transnistrian ruble transaction greater than 10,000. I haven't tried to check anything out yet, so there's no fraud detection going on. I'll add two cards to the database. One, a non-default card, and another the user's default card. Note that the card number starts with 4222 and the expiry is the 2nd of February 2029. Let's see what the user's default card looks like without any decryption. There's their encrypted card number and the expiry, which we haven't encrypted because it's not sensitive. Let's see what it looks like when decrypted and we have the 4222 card number and again the expiry. I'm only able to decrypt this because I had the password. This data would be completely inaccessible to anyone with the data, but without the encryption key. So far we have four orders that are all pending. None of them are checked out yet. So let's start checking these out. First, I'll check out the small USD order and that succeeded. We have a payment reference number, which we've added to the orders table and the status has gone to paid. We'll check out the large USD order. That too has been successful. Next, we'll check out the small Transnistrian ruble transaction. We received an error making the request there. That's just one of our simulated errors. Let's try again. That time it succeeded. And finally, we'll check out the large Transnistrian ruble transaction. And we can see that while the transaction has been successful, we might have wanted to decline this. Our fraud detection service has flagged it up as being potentially fraudulent. For the cloud part of the demo, I'll show you how you can enable things like egress perimeter controls to lock your cluster down and enable PCI compliance. This is my cluster overview. And you can see there's a section called PCI DSS ready. And once I've satisfied these five criteria, my cluster will be PCI ready. I'll just enable one of these to give you a feeling for what it looks like. And for that, I'll head over to the PCI DSS ready page where we can see that zero out of five of these tasks are complete. I will enable egress perimeter controls. And these controls are essentially a set of rules that dictate where CockroachDB can connect to. And these are provided to CockroachDB as JSON files. Here I have a rule I've called Kafka that allows data to leave the cluster to this side of range. On these ports, I allow data to leave the cluster on these ports for S3 in Singapore into this bucket and that can be used for things like backups, exports and any CDC change feeds that send messages to S3. I have the same for the EU and I have the same for the US. I'll make a note of the cluster ID and I'll create an environment variable to help with these requests that I'll be making. With this request I disable all outbound connections for my cluster. Note that you'll need a security token and this can be enabled 
in organization access management service accounts. I've created an account that has the rights to perform these actions. With that enabled, I can come back to my cluster and I can see that egress perimeter controls are now active. Essentially, the cluster is basically inaccessible from the outside world now. So let's add the Kafka and S3 rules that will allow the cluster to talk to the outside world. First, the Kafka rules. Next, the S3 APAC rules. Next, the EU rules. And finally, the US rules. And back in the console, one out of five of the PCI DSS readiness tasks is now complete. Once again, you'd need to perform all of these for your cluster to be PCI ready. But with each of them, there's documentation on how you go about it. All of the use cases we've explored come with their own requirements on resilience, consistency, and security. With payments use case, these are particularly important. Get security wrong, and that leads to huge financial and legal implications. Get consistency wrong, and that leads to huge financial and legal implications. Get resilience wrong, and people can't access their accounts. They can't make or receive payments. Merchants miss out on huge opportunities to sell their products, all leading to huge financial and legal implications. PCI compliance goes quite deep and it's also concerned with what you store and for how long. For example, you can't store sensitive authentication data after a payment has been made. That's one in a bunch of considerations you need to make in order to satisfy PCI compliance. CockroachDB can satisfy a lot of the data storage concerns for you, but there are a lot of considerations that still need to be made. 